Hello everyone, my name is Nehed Mansour and I'm the Curator of Programs and Education at the Gardner Museum. Thank you for joining us today for a virtual spotlight tour with guest speaker, Dr. Alexis Shotwell. This program focuses on a selection of works from Sherry Boyle's solo exhibition titled Outside the Palace of Me, which speaks to the subject of whiteness. You will notice your mics and videos um, are muted and the chat option has been disabled. There will be a Q&A following today's program, so we invite you to send us questions through the Q&A function at any point in time. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that for thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Pitoon, and the Mississaugas of the First Credit Nation. Sorry, the Credit First Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and live on this land. I would now like to invite Alexis to turn on her mic as I read her bio. Dr. Alexis Shotwell is a professor at Carleton University on unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin land. Her academic work addresses impurity, environmental justice, racial formation, disability, unspeakable and unspoken knowledge, sexuality, gender, and political transformation. She is the author of Knowing Otherwise, Race, Gender, Implicit Understanding, uh, published by Penn State Press in 2011, and Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times by Minnesota University Press in 2016. Alexis, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen here. Is everyone seeing this? No, I can't see you, so I'm just assuming that you are. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking everyone at The Gardener um, for all your work on this, which I know was huge, um, and also for the invitation to share some thoughts. So thank you to Sama Kakabi and Mahed Mansour and uh, Richard Tang for holding the infrastructure, uh, and to um, curator Sequoia Miller, and of course Sherry Boyle for uh, making this work so that we can engage with it. Um, so maybe some of you have been at events or seen the exhibit in person. Um, I uh, am going to ask Nahed to post in the chat, which I hope you can see an access copy to my remarks today. So this is written notes, um, which you're welcome to follow along with if reading is easier than listening. Um, I also am wondering if you would message um, through the Q&A if anyone who's here today needs uh, or would benefit from detailed image description. I'll be doing some image description, but um, I won't do a very detailed one unless anyone needs it. Um, and I guess the other things that I always say at the beginning of Zoom uh, things is that the great gift of this is that you can do whatever feels good for your body and mind today. So um, you can lie down or stim or move. Um, and I encourage all of that. Um, we'll have some time for conversation. Um, at the end, you're welcome to uh, send questions in as they come up for you. So you can just send them in the chat um, and uh, Nahed and Sequoia will help me um, try to address those at, at, at the end um, in, this, in this hour. So um, in this image, we're about to enter the exhibit, which is exiting the backstage and stepping into a performance space. So I always, uh, whenever I'm in this kind of backstage moment, like to take a minute and focus on who we are in this room and what our relations of responsibility are that we're carrying. So I was born on um, Uta and Arapaho land. I was an uninvited settler first to Mi'kma'ki and later through various other places in North America to where I live now on uh, Algonquin land. So making an acknowledgement like this, which we think of now as a land acknowledgement, I really want us to think about this as a, a way of placing ourselves in responsibility to work against the inheritances of genocidal colonization and chattel slavery, and equally against the ongoing depredations of capitalism's death wish for our planet 
and all the seen and unseen beings who live here with us. Um, and that's kind of the motivation that I bring in to um, engaging with this, this work. So this talk is gonna discuss um, racism and colorism and colonialism and genocide and rape and eugenics. Um, although there's no graphic images or descriptions um, anyway, more graphic than, uh, than are in the show. And there's gonna be no flashing images in this, um, in this presentation. So on the stage of this show, but also in our lives, we enact different roles. Our expressive intent does not control the interpretive uptake we might receive. So talking about something like whiteness invites us to dwell with the complexity of social relations that are entirely made up but have real effects. We make and remake ourselves and the world always in relation with others. Sherry Boyle's work here stages some relations, offers us some relations with which or with whom we can identify or disidentify. Figures, images, and also the space of the stage, the other people who might move through it with us in complex configurations of gaze and body. I wanna say that we experience whiteness this way, as a whole world that we move through with others, a co-production in which we are differentially situated and for whom the meaning we make shifts depending on how others per perceive and position us. So this is always power laden. So in order to get into this, I wanna give a few just kind of orienting guide rails for thinking about whiteness, um, which is a notoriously difficult thing to think about, talk about, um, transform, possibly destroy, especially I think in the Canadian context. So the first thing for us to just hold in mind is that whiteness is a social relation. It's made up, but it really exists and it has material effects. So although there's no biological or physical marker that actually stably over time identifies someone as being white, there are lots and lots of social and political markers that do this. I'm an academic, so some of the things that I use are um, quotes from people that I think have um, explained things beautifully. So this is, uh, this is one of the academic quotes that you're going to encounter in this next hour. So I think of um, Michael Omi and Howard Wenant, who wrote about race. There is a continuous temptation to think of race as an essence, something fixed, concrete, and objective. And there is also an opposite temptation to imagine race as a mere illusion, a purely ideological construct, which some ideal non-racist social order would eliminate. So they name this process through which race exists, racial formation. They, they think about race as an activity, a socio-historical process by which racial categories are created, inhabited, transformed, and destroyed. So here as a kind of guide rail, um, we can start by recognizing that whiteness as a social relationship of oppression and benefit, right? Oppression for some, benefit for others, has not always existed. It, it's a historical creation. Um, we can recognize that white isn't a biological category. And then we can ask, once we realize it didn't have to be this way, what it would take to destroy the work that it currently does to wake, make whiteness as that relation of oppression and benefit no longer exist. Um, and I think we can reflect on how looking at art, making art um, can help in that uh, creative destruction. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on the white elephant figure and on the images that bracket them as particularly rich sites for thinking about whiteness. Um, but I have to say that I was tempted to frame this discussion about whiteness exclusively through the work in this exhibit that is not overtly or obviously about whiteness or white people. And I think that actually we can understand that often the most important places to understand whiteness are, and I'm just gonna click through some of the other works in this exhibit pretty quickly, um, but we can look at how we think about whiteness when we look at how culture creates identity how culture is racialized, travels, and becomes mutually implicated, co-shaped 
the echoes of what Franz Fanon called epidermalization or black skin contemplating white masks, the entanglements of racial capital with spectacle and performance as in this centering piece, um, which you can pay to play, the entanglements of um, gender and sex and how they are always lived through race and vice versa in ways that mark the vital importance of resisting binaries and fixity as we move toward worlds that can celebrate the glorious complexity of our actual lives. But we don't have so much time. So um, although all of those things are connected and we could have such an interesting conversation, let's focus on what we can diffract about whiteness in the Canadian context through these works. So the, this figure of the white elephant and its affiliated paintings, Lone Gunman and Settler. So as Boyle said in one of the conversations over this last month, white elephant names whiteness as the perpetual elephant in the room, which white people would like to not have to acknowledge or talk about, even as it distorts the fabric of space and time. And a white elephant sale is often of those things that people don't want, but have priced too high to sell, um, that which has been overvalued but cannot be disposed of. But it's, it's interesting for us to go a little further back and ask, where does that sense of white elephant come from? And it turns out it comes from like OG colonialism. So this phrase, the white elephant, densely figures some intertwined material and symbolic formations of whiteness as it manifests today through an actual animal other who existed. So on screen is Tuang Taluang, who was a Burmese um, from what's now Myanmar elephant with a distinctive epidermal pattern, um, pale patches on their body. So symbolically in parts of cosmology in Siam and Burma, and also in certain Buddhist cosmologies, the, the Buddha's mom had a dream of a white elephant entering her stomach when she was pregnant with him. So um, a birth of a, what's called a Chang Paok or strange colored elephant uh, marked the auspiciousness or legitimacy of the monarch ruling at the time. So um, they became symbolically important when Britain invaded and took over direct rule of Burma um, over the course of, of three wars. So this didn't happen right like immediately. So between 1824 and 1885, um, Britain was engaged in ongoing um, wars of aggression. And white elephants and their place in um, what was called oriental you know, cosmology became these complex fetish objects for the British colonial imaginary. So when circus operator P.T. Burnham of Barnum and Bailey um, bought and brought to first London and the US this particular specific white elephant, um, we could maybe have expected that it would catalyze a, an enormous um, cross-Atlantic conversation about race and whiteness. So there's a wonderful paper that I'm not going to say very much about by Sarah Amato, um, which is a social history of Tuang Taluang and race. Um, and Amato notes this definition from the uh, OED of the 1850s, um, so before this actual you know, specific white elephant, which defined the white elephant as a, a rare albino variety, highly venerated, and then went on to tell um, a story that as far as I've been able to figure out is just something the British made up, um, which was that it was figuratively a burdensome or costly possession from the story of the kings of Siam who were accustomed to make a present of one of these animals to courtiers who had rendered themselves obnoxious in order to ruin the recipient by the cost of its maintenance. Also an object scheme, et cetera, considered to be without use or value. So, so that um, idea that the white elephant is something that would require so much care because you were a degenerate oriental type who worshiped animals and was sort of animalistic yourself, but then kept them very clean and would ruin yourself in order. Like all of that is just about the British. Um, it's just about the British's colonial imaginary as part of their wars of aggression. So Amato in this, piece um, examines how debates about whether Tuang Taluang was really white or modeled or whether he was becoming whiter the longer he was away from the East and what it would mean about the orientalized other for him to be venerated in the ways that Barnum claimed 
um, all of this was really uh, debated in papers uh, at the British Zoological Association um, in various scientific fora in the US. Um, it, was a, it was a major discussion. The elephant triggered this major discussion about race. And this um, continued, this, the elephants, actual elephants adventures in the US continued um, and were facilitated by the Pears Soap campaign that quickly transversed something um, about the elephant as possessing a blackness that could be washed off through Pears Soap to blackness in general as something that could be washed off. So, so here we have two racist cartoons um, that are differently racist, um, but the, the thing that um, doesn't get talked about very much in the second one um, of the humans is this connection back to this historical white elephant. So here we have one aspect of whiteness, which is the epidermal question, the pigmentation, melanin, or looking white. Determining who is really white by the color of their skin or the texture of their hair um, alongside other physiognomy criteria has of course been a key technology of racial oppression globally. And one of the fears that 19th century racists had about Tuan Talawang was precisely what they're marketing in these ads, the worry that color could be erased. And this fear that if it was so easy to become white, it would be hard to maintain the racial order. So some of the newspaper articles like in the New York Times, for example, posited a, a world in which people could become um, whiter than white people, and then white people would be oppressed the way that black and brown people then were. So there's a certain way that Boyle's white elephant is this kind of white that no white person actually is, from their skin color to their nose, lips, eyes, hair texture, and a kind of politely cold expression. Um, I think Boyle is here deploying some of the visual markers that have been really central to the racial project of whiteness as um, spectacle, as view. But as marked by the racial anxieties white people had about the existence of a white elephant or an elephant who could be made white, the project of whiteness requires constant vigilance, a 360 degree pivot on a moment's notice. So this is um, some stills of the white elephant um, pivoting their head uh, on a motion sensor. So these, this pivot um, moves from imputing racial biological markers to stabilizing a social order that creates racial meaning. Um, the figure obviously harkens back to many horror tropes in that uncanny spin of their head, along with the distortion of the white elephant's body. And these things might enact the affective charge of horror in viewers of the exhibit. We can't get that charge through looking at this still image in a predictable way. I have two um, really brilliant colleagues, Laura Hall um, with me at Carleton and Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who's at University of New Hampshire, who have both elaborated the ways that horror, I mean, among other people too, but these are the people that I've been in conversation with, the ways that horror as a genre is really densely entangled with legacies of chattel slavery in the North American context and genocidal colonialism. Um, especially in the ways that horror works through the possibility that people could resist Christian domination. So there's a lot of interesting questions here, which I'm not competent to get into, about what it means to deploy this genre of horror, to be horrified by whiteness, especially for those of us who are white. This is something that I think about a lot. What does it mean to be horrified by whiteness when you are white? And I'm happy to talk more about that in, um, in the Q&A period. So color-based racism, as, as we see in this kind of epidermal question, matters in the Canadian context. Everywhere from the ongoing reality of police murdering Black, Indigenous, and other racialized people when they do not kill white people, to less overtly more murderous forms of interpersonal racism. But let's also consider what was happening in Canada the same year Tuong Talawang was brought over to North America and all of those debates and conversation about color were happening, 1884. So 1884 was an early iteration of what would later become the Indian Act 
um, Johnny McDonald forwarded this as the Indian Advancement Act. And this was one of the first iterations of what would be many more uh, of what the Canadian government um, disingenuously called enfranchisement, which sounds like a good thing that you would want to be enfranchised. Um, but enfranchisement actually was a process by which if you were Indigenous and you registered to vote, um, became a clergy person, um, married in particular ways, went to university, you um, were enfranchised into the Canadian polity and you, were, you lost your Indigenous status. So enfranchisement was um, one part of this broader genocidal goal of doing away with Indigenous being. And in the Indian Advancement Act, this was also sort of the first place where voting was tied to that, and also where the nascent Canadian government was um, aiming to take over direct governance of indigenous, um, indigenous people, right? So replacing uh, existing longstanding governance structures with Canadian governance structures. So the act and all subsequent versions of it aimed at the extinguishment of indigenous being this extinguishment was material, manifest in the government's stated policies to use starvation, confinement to reserve systems, and withdrawal of medical care to kill Indigenous people. Um, and MacDonald and the Dominion and subsequent Canadian government used these extermination practices, including but by no means limited to stealing children for their, from their communities through forced residential schooling and later the 60s scoop as an arm in the broader genocidal project that continues to ground what is currently Canada. That project uses legal extinguishment in attempts to formally end treaty and other relationships that require Canada to, Canada to respect the sovereignty of Indigenous people. So Indigenous people and their governance structures, beings, and relationships with other beings and places are not dependent on Canadian recognition much as Canada has tried to make them dependent on that recognition and then withhold it. Um, so I think when we look at this emaciated white elephant seated kind of in a position of judgment, head spinning, the long arms of the law ready to hand, whose mouth is so small that they cannot ever consume enough to satisfy their long, long body, this might be a figure of this manifestation of whiteness. This is whiteness as the legal arrangements that determine who can enter or stay in the country, who has standing for civil engagement in all its forms, who should be imprisoned, and how resources are distributed. Whiteness like this is hard for white people to perceive, even as it is constantly apparent to the people it targets for our benefit. Now, the way that Canadian whiteness happens is really particular. And I'm originally a US American, so I've um, thought about this a lot. In Canada, often when we talk about racism and whiteness, people say that we're better than the US. So let's consider this figure of the lone gunman who evokes the Boy Scouts and Hitler Youth and the agent of um, deadly mass shootings that happen so regularly now in the US that they're not even reported really. And certainly they're not, they're not reported as um, a form of racial formation, a way that whiteness is stabilized. So here, thinking on this piece, I think of Charles Mills who argued for what he called a racial contract, which for him um, creates or constitutes whiteness. So he thought about this in the social contract history in Western philosophy. Um, as social contracts are like formal and informal agreements that we enter into that govern society. Mills thought the racial contract is formal and informal agreements that happen between white people to sort the world into groups with, as he put it, the aim of a differential privileging of white people as a group with respect to non-white people as a group, the exploitation of their bodies, lands, and resources, and the denial of equal socioeconomic opportunities to them. So he said, all white people are beneficiaries of the contract, though only some white people are, are, oh, sorry, this should say, all white people are beneficiaries to the contract, although only some white people are signatories to it. 
So you don't have to have actually signed it in order to benefit from it. Um, I think we can see the lone gunman, his violence and the refusal to reckon with what that violence protects, expressing one aspect of the racial formation that is whiteness in this mode of a racial contract between white people to create and then discipline a racial order. So whiteness as in continual need of defense, collusion, and violent maintenance. He also signals the violence of resource extraction, militarism, and the idea that it is possible to have dominion over the land and the beasts that walk upon it, and that some people have been given the God-given right to that dominion. Eileen Morrington Robinson, in a really beautiful book, which I recommend to you, uh, called The White Possessive, thinking mostly about the Australian context, but it, it really resonates here. Um, focuses, Morton Robinson focuses on the aspect of the racial contract which operates on this logic of the white possessive. So similarly to Mill's definition, she argues that racialization is the process by which whiteness operates possessively to define and construct itself as the pinnacle of its own racial hierarchy. So thinking about that ownership, right? And the gun as a key technology for enforcing the very idea that ownership is possible. With whiteness emerging from the classifications of who can own and who or what can be owned. So this is practical, like in inherited wealth being the engine of home ownership and much inherited wealth going back to chattel slavery. Um, it's ideological as when black people entering their own houses are assumed to be robbers. Um, and as Robin Maynard argues in her work on blackness in the Canadian context, um, Harsha Walia in her work on the violence of border maintenance and many, many indigenous scholars in thinking about the ongoing inheritances and practices of um, ongoing genocide on this land through the idea that you can own land. It's really important for us to consider the role of state violence in the creation and maintenance of the racial order. So from colonization through to police murders of racialized people, through to the RCMP um, intervening in Wet'suwet'en land defense to bring pipelines through. So who has sanctioned or official access to guns and who they kill tells us a lot about the racial organization of violence in our world and what that violence protects. But whiteness is also organized through the eugenic work of determining who should reproduce the pure white race and who should be sterilized. So Boyle pairs that kind of boyish representation of the RCMP with this figuration of the settler, a young, pregnant, chained white woman who is necessary to secure the future of the white nation. So we see here the ways that the settler is bound by her own whiteness. But as she gets what we hope is some ease from the pot that she's smoking, we can see this echo between her fingers clutching her chains and the fingers that clutch her from the covered wagon behind her. So for me, this is an important reference to the ways that white women have been central figures in the violence needed out to racialized men in particular, sexualized violence. White feminists thus can trouble rather than embrace the anesthetic necessary to either numb out to our complicity with or actively participate in the evils of racism. And Alison Bailey has a great book called The Weight of Whiteness where she talks about this question of anesthetized whiteness. And I'm happy to talk more about that too. So today here in Ottawa, there's a March for Life, which is an anti-abortion march that um, the publicly funded Catholic school board buses school children here as part of their taxpayer funded field trips um, to protest their own capacity to have reproductive autonomy. Um, and, uh, and then there's counter protests right, right this minute actually happening. Um, and of course, looking across the US border, um, there's lots of people trying to fight for meaningful access to abortion in both national contexts. So as we fight for that, we can also remember 
that the forced sterilization of racialized people and disabled people are part of the eugenic project of the forced pregnancy for the white race that this image might um, evoke for us. So white supremacists here in Canada, as well as abroad, consistently reference a commitment to securing a future for whiteness. So whether they overtly reference the 14 words of white supremacist David Duke, which are, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. So this is a kind of fear of erasure that white people are gonna be bred out of existence. Or in the just very slightly masked formulation of the current progressive conservative party, the idea that um, the progressive conservatives are, need to secure the future. Um, so it's just astonishing to me that we can have that slogan as a, a national political party right now and not have people recognize that it's echoing the 14 words. Um, so this figure of the pregnant white woman settler asks us what other futures we can imagine, which don't just echo the horrific histories and presence that we now live. So what other futures? Well, again, in the Canadian context in particular, evocations of multiculturalism and diversity often stand as a counter to this triptych of the white elephant, the lone gunman, the innocent yet knowing settler. So we can kind of return to everyone in this exhibit who is not so overtly coded as white. We can ask what's the relationship between them and the figure of the white elephant, the lone gunman, the settler. So most of what I've elaborated so far applies to white racial formation across North America, grounding in those founding violences of settler colonialism and chattel slavery and border militarism. But in Canada, we have this maybe more subtle unfolding of white racial formation and the racial contract, which uses the language of diversity and multiculturalism. So to be a diverse and multicultural nation sounds good or like anyhow better than being an overt like machine of white supremacy. And, and I think like I wanna flag that it's complicated here because decrying multiculturalism is also like securing the future, a, um, a dog whistle of the right. It's a, it signals that you're on side with a particular kind of white supremacist um, politic. So here I turn to two really, in, incredible Canadian theorists, Himani Banerjee and Sanera Tabani, who elaborated many years ago that what seemed to be value neutral or actually quite positive commitments to multiplicity and complexity are actually much more complicated. Being a mosaic rather than a melting pot seems to hold the promise of everyone being able to have their own dignity. But these thinkers and others argue that what happens instead is a solidification of conceptions of people framed as diverse or multiculturalism, so everyone who's not white, into fixed cultural or ethnic groups who are then seen as the site of difference, sort of like titillating or interesting difference, but also backwardness and also culture. So that everyone who has those framings, who's framed as the diverse, diversity hire or the multicultural space, um, they're everything that's not white, and that's part of how whiteness in Canada happens. So in the wake of World War II, with some discrediting of scientific racism and some like no longer as possible to just be overtly eugenist, um, and in the wake of struggles against colonialism, Sanera Tabani argues that in Canada, multiculturalism, which she frames as multiculturalism from above, was to prove critical to the rescuing of Euro slash white cultural supremacy. White subjects were constituted as tolerant and respectful of difference and diversity, while non-white people were instead constructed as perpetually and irredeemably monocultural in need of being taught the virtues of tolerance and cosmopolitanism under white supervision. So that it was important for multiculturalism and diversity to exist so that white people could manifest how tolerant caring and cosmopolitan we are, um, but also to fix that otherness as a stable and demarcated part of the Canadian identity. So as white people look hard at ourselves, maybe with new eyes, what can we do with what we see? If this exhibit is to help us think about whiteness, situated as it is 
in the context of an art world that has not yet collectively reckoned with its own whiteness and the material conditions that make questions about race consistently the white elephant in the room. What kind of action might it spark? What new faces might we shape if white people aim to refuse the benefits we receive from whiteness and repair the harms of the inheritances we've received? So one option is to come to this exhibit or to think about whiteness and just feel bad. Uh, lots of us do this. White people feel bad. We decide we need to learn more, read more, and so on. So when we do this, the bad feeling and the learning and the learning more and the feeling bad about what we've learned can become the end point to our actions. They, they have a sort of problem closure. And this doesn't actually, just feeling bad and learning more and feeling bad and learning more, doesn't actually help dismantle white supremacy and massively transform the racial order that is doing its part to destroy our shared world. So the best way to break the racial contract to transform racial formation is to become a traitor to whiteness through collective action. This doesn't have to take the form of a protest march, although it can and often does. This doesn't have to take the form of um, working together in ways that we already can predict. We can say that wherever white people are situated, we are made complicit, often against our will, with horrific wrongs things that we do not want to happen. And with each point of complicity, each thing that we want to repudiate, we can also take those as sites for traction for transformation. We can ask both in daily life and as we set broader strategic goals for collective transformation, how we can rend the forms of life that stabilize racism, not just interpersonally, but collectively, socially, and systematically. As the tombstone for Joel Olson, who was a theorist and activist asked, what is the most damage I can do given my biography, abilities and commitments to the racial order and the rule of capital? We can ask, are we upholding whiteness? Are we keeping to that contract or are we transforming and destroying it? These are helpful questions. And ones I think Shari Boyle's work in this exhibit helps us ask. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alexis, for that presentation. It was incredibly insightful. And um, thank you for pointing out the questions that we should be asking as uh, visitors when we look at this work. Um, I'd like to invite um, Chief Curator of the Gardner Museum and Curator of Outside the Palace of Me, Sequoia Miller, to this conversation. Welcome, Sequoia. Thank you, Nahed. And um, thank you, uh, Professor Shotwell, for that fantastic um, talk and um, rumination and bringing in so many, um, so many ideas and references and questions. So, um, so much there. And it's a little hard to <laughs> kind of come right, like, <laughs> come, right, come right at you with a question. Um, I think, though, so first off, I want to encourage all the participants to add your thoughts or your questions to the Q&A for sure, and we'll um, incorporate those and, and guide those into our, our chat. I, I think, Alexis, I'd love to start with kind of the last, the last set of questions you were raising about the idea of the sort of feeling bad and learning more cycle, um, mm -hmm. kind of being, being a cycle, actually, being an, almost an end unto itself. And I've been thinking about that. Um, I really throughout the run of the exhibition, as I've, you know, led a number of groups through the um, through the show, and have spoken about white elephant, you know, with um, with audiences and with visitors to think about the sort of the steps that are involved from sort of raising the conversation or visualizing whiteness, as Sherry's doing, mm -hmm. and, and trying to think in a more pointed or focused way about what follows, what, what comes after, what comes after that, or through that, maybe. Um, and I think I'd, I'd love to just ask you more about this notion of, um, of transformation and creative destruction, and sort of how you see that, I guess, taking shape, or sort of where do, it sort of steps ahead, kind of like, the, the what do we do and where do we go and how you think yeah. about that for yourself yeah yeah that's a lovely question 
I mean, so I think that one part of um, what's really interesting and useful for us to do is to actually ask what kind of feeling bad we're having. Um, so there's various, um, and this is this comes back also to the, that thing that I started with, which I know um, you all know more about than I do, about the space between expressive intent and interpretive uptake. Um, so I really think about the ways that the feelings that are offered to us collectively and socially might not be sufficient to help us know how we actually feel. So there's a kind of flattening of the affective space that we enter into, especially as white people, when we're talking about race. Um, so one of the things that's given to us is, is these kind of displacing and repudiating feelings um, that, are, that are like, here's how you're feeling. So, oh, you say you feel bad, but you have nothing to feel guilty about. So that's, a, that's offering like, is the bad feeling that you're having guilt? And then you're like, well, no, I didn't personally own any slaves. I didn't personally shoot anyone. So it's a kind of, um, it's like, it creates like a pocket universe or something. Um, so one of the things that's helpful is for us to have um, more of these spaces of openness and um, like a little bit of rupture to be able to have and stay with more complicated feelings that we might not have good words for yet. Um, so sometimes we can just shift how we're thinking and talking about that. So I've done a lot of work on the, the difference between white guilt, which is, in my view, never a particularly helpful white feeling, um, and white shame, which sometimes is, because, um, because feelings like shame or complicity or implication don't point us back to ourselves. They point us toward, if I feel that um, this world should not be this way, and I don't want to benefit from this kind of horror, then I need to change the world instead of just getting better myself. So having a bigger palette of emotion can be helpful. And I think this is something that, um, you know, doing things like, like in the show, not having text that people look at to figure out how they're supposed to feel about a work is a way of saying, what might, you, what might you open to if you didn't have a preset interpretive frame to corral the, the chaos of your feeling, you know? And, and how would that manifest and how would that change you? Um, but then, you know, the other piece is that um, white people who want to focus on fighting racism, you know, destroying it, it there, there aren't very many easy ways to get involved in collective work, right? That, that social movements are sort of on their back foot right now. Um, and, and many people have never been involved in any kind of collective project at all, right? Or if they have, it's been a, a hugely hierarchical one organized through their wage job. So, I'm really interested in when we think about taking every place we notice whiteness as a place of traction, starting to ask, how can I just stitch together one, like one more chain in a link of people who are interested in not enforcing the racial contract and changing some of the systemic and material things. So just that move from trying to not mess up ourselves, like trying not to say the wrong thing or trying to apologize correctly when we've said the wrong thing or done the wrong thing to asking how we change that material condition. That interests me a lot. And what I've observed is that that's also a much richer space for white people um, to not just get in that sort of loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think this, the notion of the racial contract and enforcing or observing the racial contract is actually a, a, a helpful kind of tool for thinking about um, where you're conforming or where you're reinforcing versus where you're destabilizing or questioning or, or sort of yeah. troubling. Um, I also think this idea of bringing shame into the conversation is really interesting as well. It's distinction from guilt on the one hand, as you mentioned, 
and also its connection to horror and to the sense of being horrified. And we do have a couple of questions that have come in to the Q and A around this idea of um, horror and being horrified by whiteness. And this was something I wanted to, to check back into. And um, there are some aspects of Sherry's imagery which are explicitly, you know, drawing from horror kind of horror film references, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, I'd love for you to expand on this, on sort of the role of, of horror in destabilizing the racial context. Yeah, thank you. So um, yes, this is, these are beautiful questions. And, um, and I feel sort of a little bit uh, not good at answering them because I am really bad at watching horror. So I've been okay at reading horror and like, um, and that's one of the reasons I'm so interested in um, this, the, and why I've had a bunch of conversations with these um, colleagues who are, who are really working on horror. So, um, so there's been an explosion of horror that is really um, thinking directly about race, um, but also uh, even looking at sort of more canonical work like Saw, um, the Saw franchise, and um, things like, as I mean, Sherry Boyle is explicitly referencing The Exorcist in this, um, that horror can be the space where the um, unimaginable other is manifest in a way that people have to reckon with and that often they fail to reckon with. Um, so there is this way, I think there's one register so Laura Hall is an indigenous theorist, um, Chanda Prescott-Weinstein is black, and, and they're thinking about horror in terms of what it does for um, racialized and indigenous people who are recognizing a kind of resurgence or an insurgence that um, has this possibility of defeating the current order. So when white people feel horrified by whiteness, um, and I'm so curious about how, how people experienced some of the, the uncanniness um, in their bodies and collectively. Um, I think that that can be this way where our um, surety and our idea that we know how the world is gonna be can be productively destabilized, right? So that those cracks can really open something. Um, because basically the thing is white people can't exist as white people if we're gonna have justice in this planet. Um, so it's good for us to have an experience of kind of ontological shudder. Mm -hmm. it, it helps us actually. Mm -hmm. So I kind of think we should just feel that and not thematize it and then turn to asking what use we can be toward of racial justice. Ontological shudder is a pretty great, <laughs> a pretty great phrase to bring in there. Um, I want to actually read, um, read a, a, actually a related question. So this comes in from um, a participant. Please, can you say a bit more about your own horror of whiteness from a personal perspective rather than an academic one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I all the time, because I've been writing and working on, um, on whiteness for 25 years now, um, I would say that my biggest feeling about whiteness is just this complete, um, uh, just, just a complete horror, um, or a sense of um, impossible revulsion and um, wish to leave. I think a lot of white people, when we start to experience like, what is this actually like? Um, do this move that um, um, gets thought about as like being numb, right? Numbing out, because to witness the kind of trauma that we routinely visit on others is horrifying. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I feel like every single time I learn about something that has been done to benefit other people like me, I have that feeling of wanting to, you know, actually like peel off my skin, right? Um, for me, it's very visceral. And I think it's true. I think it's visceral like that for a lot of people in a way that is um, hard for white people to feel because we're very used to being comfortable. Um, so that's also why I think about this as like, how can we actually meet the, the bad feelings that we have as white people 
without making racialized people do any work about them. You know, that actually leads to the next question that has come in through the chat, which is what does thinking about whiteness offer to racialized and or indigenous folks? Mm. So I am, um, I just finished teaching a class on whiteness, which was the first time I've done this. Um, like I've been doing this research for all these years. And the class was fascinating because it was um, minority white. Uh, there were nine white people in the class and um, 14 racialized people, black, indigenous, and, and otherwise racialized. And so we talked about this question a lot. Um, and so I can just report from that class, but also from other things that what people say is that it's helpful to focus sometimes on whiteness because often when we talk about race, the, and this comes back to that question of multiculturalism, the only thing that people think is race is racialized people. So they think race is racialized people and whiteness is not race. So it's easy for white people to say, I'm, race has nothing to do with me. It's harder for white people to say, whiteness has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. So some, not all, like I think it's completely legit also for racialized and indigenous people to just be like, I don't wanna learn. I know all I need to know about whiteness. I know more than any white person knows, it's accurate. <laughs> um, but there, the number of people who found it useful to look at how, especially racialized people have written about whiteness, um, give some traction for doing some of that transformation work um, and like has a little bit of a shielding um, effect, especially for some of that like direct interpersonal harm that happens between white people and racialized people in our daily lives. Hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have another question has come in, which I'll read. I'll, I'll, I'll read the question and then I'll phrase it in my terms. So the question is, will classicism always exist? If we eliminate racism, will classicism just continue to be based on something other than race? And I, th I think the way that I have been thinking about this question during your talk is around this notion of creative destruction or and transformation and sort of these interrelated ideas of dismantling something and building something else. Mm -hmm. and how much of this transformative process I guess you see or understand as being one of one that's generative in terms mm -hmm. of creating something new versus one that is more focused on the dismantling aspect. Yeah. So I think this this question about um, class and race pairs so beautifully with that question of creative destruction um, and with the question of of how how we build. So. I think the way for us to think about this is um, using, um, using the understanding that race is a modality through which class is lived. Class is a modality through which race is lived. So these things are not separate systems that, um, that uh, you know, layer on top of each other. There, there are things that happen together. So that, that whiteness is something that's framed and shaped through property relations is a question of class and a question of race. So we don't have to say which comes first. We can say, as we work against these, we're always gonna be tugging on these other things. Um, and the way that that is part of this work of creative destruction is that there's nothing we never end anything without creating it something else. So, so it's good for us to think about what the um, what the what we're creating as we end, instead of just trying to destroy. Um, so I've been working on um, some anarchist thinkers uh, who um, who really talk about the. Um, Bakunin famously says the, the urge to destroy is also a creative urge. Um, and we have Beniverti Darudi who said, you know, we who are the workers are not in the least afraid of ruins because we built everything and we can build it again and much better than this. Um, so this is the work of, of artists, right? As people who are able to, 
destroy what needs to be destroyed in a in the work of creating um and and i think one of the things that that means is really thinking about this this practical question right in in material terms what are we bringing together what do we how do we use our position to do something that hasn't yet happened that doesn't pretend that all of the history that has happened is you know illusory or doesn't exist right so it has to be um, really practical thank you for that um, I want to close, we're, we're just near the end here, I want to close with a comment and a question from Sherry, um, who's in the, in the, in the group. Um, Sherry says that without you and her speaking directly, that you've articulated so many of the concepts and questions that Sherry has attempted to provoke with her work better than she could have in words. Sherry says, I specifically requested a white speaker to address white elephant in order that the labor be taken on by a white person to continue the modeling and project of white people communicating about it. And then Sherry's question is, what role can white artists play in dismantling white mm -hmm. supremacy within the very institutions that have been built by these European principles of self-protection? Yes, that is a super easy question for me to answer in the <laughs> two minutes that we have left. Um, well, I mean, so Sherry, I really do wanna thank you for this work and for um, it's been really an honor to, to talk about it um, and think with it. And I've spent a, like a really a lot of time thinking with it over the last while. Um, and it's hard to know how, um, I think about this also being a white academic in an institution that is so stably built on perpetuating white supremacism. Um, so I think it's partially about how do we use the tools that we have to um, disrupt and challenge the things we receive and inherit? Um, how do we center and lift up people in non-condescending ways that are not just about tokenizing? Like, how do we have a real engagement, right? So some of that is like Sequoia and your curatorial practice. I'm sure you think about this a lot. Um, and it's about how do we make um, relationships of responsibility that transform the systems. So I think it's just really long, slow work. I don't think it means stopping working as artists or thinkers. I think it means continuing to work um, and building forms of relationship that we actually can show up for um, because Maybe at root, you know, the, the work of whiteness is um, isolating and breaking relationship. It's, it's a form of making treaties and then breaking them, right? It's, so everything that we do that is genuine and relational and connective is one way of fighting racism. Um, and then we have to really be very practical also of like, give the grants not to white people even though white people deserve to eat, you know, so it's really complicated. Yeah. I think that this, this notion of relationships of responsibility and um, substantive relationships is a great place for us to, to close the conversation. Um, I'd like to thank you, um, Alexis, Professor Shotwell, for your, for your work today. It's been really, um, really illuminating, really phenomenal to, um, to hear your perspectives and to engage with you on on this topic and on these fantastic artworks of Sherry Boyle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining um, The Gardener. The exhibition runs uh, through the end of this weekend uh, here at The Gardener and then is appearing at a handful of other museums off to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts next. So stay tuned um, for more. Thank you so much. <laughs>